Welcome to Financially Speaking, I'm Sean Latter. Now, as small to medium businesses continue to gain traction in our country's economy, more and more South Africans are ignoring the allure of working for a corporate and choosing rather to follow their own path. However, with the success or failure of a business pegged on the business owner, their business partner if they have one, and perhaps one or two key staff members, human capital becomes not only the single greatest asset in a business, but also its single greatest risk. Join me in studio to discuss the topic of business assurance is Raylan Dunbar, financial advisor at FinLogic, and Michelle Human, legal marketing advisor at Liberty. Firstly, good evening to the guests. Michelle, nice to have you back on the show. Thanks, Sean. Before we get into our discussion, let's take a quick look at a viewer's question we received. It comes from Mario in Glen Vista, and he asks, I'm worried that if my partner dies, his wife may want to take over his shares in the business and help run the business. How can I avoid this scenario from happening? Well, certainly business assurance, a very, very wide subject. We're going to try and hammer away at some of it tonight. I'm sure we're going to go into another show on this as well. But Michelle, purely from your side, given the question at hand, how would you respond to that? I think it's probably the million dollar question when it comes to business assurance. And every question that every client should be thinking about is, do I have some form of succession plan? Now, as your viewer mentioned, you never know which side of the fence you're going to be sitting on. Are you the person who's going to be deceased, who's wanting maximum value out for your surviving spouse, your children, etc.? Or are you going to be the person left behind who's wondering who your new business partner is going to be? And in this case, it might actually be the surviving spouse. And, and we're really, when it comes to this type of succession plan, a buy and sell agreement is the ideal solution. It allows you to kind of tie up all of those loose ends now while both parties are still alive. Okay. Roland, obviously buy and sell agreements is now the, the topic at hand. I mean, what is the structure that lies behind something like a buy and sell agreement for partners? Buy and sell agreements are really set up that all of your business partners or owners in the actual company are insured for their percentage share of the business. So what will need to happen is that you would need to have the company properly valued in terms of a fair market value at that point in time. From that point, you need to be in a position where you're dividing it up according to shareholding in the actual company. Based on that, each person will have to take out a life and possibly a disability policy uh, for, for the actual benefits to be, uh, to be covered. And then in the event where somebody is in a position where they pass away, the other owners effectively will own their proportion of the business or of that policy as such. Now based, up, based in that effect effectively is that your ownership is really there from the other owner's point of view. The life assured is in a position where obviously if he dies, the money will be paid over to the owners, which are also the beneficiaries on the policy. That position then allows the owners to be in a position that they've got the cash to be able to pay out to a surviving spouse or family members or whatever the case. And with that cash, obviously it allows that exact buy and sell to happen so that the shares are effectively passed on back to the original owners and the, the payment is really made out to the family to be able to, to go forward in terms of their estate plan. So it's really important that the structure is 100% right. Um, what's also nice though in terms of the, the, the business assurance, especially a buy and sell agreement, is that if it is correctly structured, um, there's a section in terms of the Estate Duty Act that actually allows you to get it exempt from estate duty. Yeah. So especially where businesses are these massive large values, you know, 10 or 20 million rands worth of uh, value as such in the company, if a shareholder has got, say, 10 million rands worth of cover, he doesn't need to pay a state duty on that 10 million rand. And that's really a very important part of business assurance to make sure that it's correctly structured and also that there's no change of ownership on those policies. Otherwise, sure. there's also capital gains tax as yeah. well. Yeah, I mean, looking at it, though, the value of that uh, policy is really a replacement of the business asset that's already been included in your property and, and, and therefore potentially estate duty paid on that already. So it's, it's really a matter of saying, I don't want to, I'm not necessarily saving on estate duty, but I might not be paying more than I have to. Michelle, I mean, Raylan's picked up really on, on the life insurance part of it. Now, to my mm -hmm. mind, when having a look at buy and sell arrangements, you've got two distinct areas. The one is the agreement itself, and the second is really the funding mechanism. Mm -hmm. Now, we've spoken about life insurance as a funding mechanism. To my mind, it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. If I've got the capital purchase, my partner, is a life insurance policy necessary in that case? No, Sean, you know, 
I think you've hit on something quite important there, and that is that you have two separate aspects to this type of planning. You've got the buy and sell agreement, which is really the contract between the different parties to say that if something happens to you or to I, the surviving partner will buy out those shares. And that forms the contractual obligation. How are we going to fund that buying and selling of shares is completely up to us. So mm. if you do have sufficient capital, then a policy would not be required. But you know, generally, a life assurance policy is the most cost-effective way to provide you with that immediate capital. Mm. When you say I mean, co cost-effective, I guess it's, it's relative. If, if, if I've got the capital, why should I, I pay for something that I might not necessarily 100%. actually need? If you've um, got the capital it. and it is readily available, you mm. wouldn't need the policy. Um, I always like to put a policy in place because we never know what's going to happen in the future. Sure. Your capital might get tied up and now suddenly when that event does happen, the capital's not readily available. Mm. Um, mm. So that's why life assurance does pose quite a good solution. Yeah, mm. okay, so good, good solution is a funding mechanism. Of course, the agreement, the other critical, critical part mm. and perhaps one that's overlooked often. Very often. Very many times, especially being an advisor, I go out there, speak to people about their business assurance solutions. They're very proud by the fact that they have a buy and sell agreement in place or a buy and sell policies mm. in place, but very often do not have the actual agreement in place. Or they might update their policies on a regular basis based on the actual value of the business. Mm. But again, the, the actual agreement doesn't get looked at again. So this is a very, very important part because that agreement is really the thing that binds that policy to force the owner to be in a position to release that money to your beneficiaries. I mean, if you don't have a buy and sell agreement in place, effectively that business partner can take the cash, pocket it, and say, well, I'm prepared to pay you off over the next 10 years at 500 rand a month if that's what it's going to come down to. So it's really a very, very important part of buy and sell agreements. You don't want to be in a position where you've planned your whole estate and made sure that there's enough liquidity for your family, and then suddenly a few million rand doesn't arrive at your door effectively, and obviously the family is going to suffer accordingly. Yeah, so certain financial implications, but, but of course practical ones. I mean, if, if, if I'm a business owner and I have the potential of somebody, my partner's son or my partner's wife or husband or whatever the case may be, coming into the business because they have no other choice, there's practical implications from, from a business perspective, isn't there? It's certainly not ideal. Mm. You know, here you are, you're one partner down, you're wanting to still make a success of the business, and now you've got this interference factor, you know, and, and it's really not ideal from a business perspective. And so many business people overlook the fact that a buy and sell agreement is so necessary. Mm -hmm. They think that because they've got their shareholders agreement in place, you know, it's, it's a good 30 page document, it should take care of these kind of things. But often your shareholders agreement has got a couple of lines somewhere in it, giving you the option to buy those shares in the event of death or disability. Mm -hmm. Now remember, that's only an option. Whereas the buy and sell agreement creates the contractual obligation. So if you don't buy my shares when I pass away, the executive of my estate is going to sue you for breach of contract. Sure. And you know, th that's kind of as solid as it gets. Whereas that option can always be refused. Okay, so providing the certainty for both the surviving and the, the uh, deceased families, I guess, uh, mm -hmm. if nothing else. Raylan picked up just briefly just now on the, the structuring of it. Now, I mm -hmm. know that there's the 3P rule. Perhaps you want to just take us through the 3P yes. rule and what it actually means and, and what to look out for if viewers actually have got buy and sell arrangements in place. Well, as Raylan mentioned, if you correctly structure your buy and sell agreement, you're not going to be paying any additional estate duty on the value of your policy. The general rule in estate planning is that any policy on your life forms deemed property in your estate. However, if you can meet what you refer to as the three Ps, the three requirements of the Estate Duty Act, effectively then that policy exem is exempt from estate duty. And those three Ps are very simply pop, uh, partners, which means that you and I must be partners at the date of death. The second P is purpose of the policy, and that's very easily proved with your buy and sell agreement. The purpose must be to enable me to buy those shares. And then the third P is going to be the premium. You may not pay your premium on your own life policy. And that's where the structuring becomes so important. It's very easy if it's just two partners, you pay the premium on my policy, I pay the premium on yours. Sure. But when there's maybe 50 of us, we need to make sure that we break that up according to our pro rata shares in the business. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I know one of the, the mechanisms used as well from a premium point of view is to create loan accounts within the company. A lot of people mm -hmm. feel very difficult to say, I'm going to take my after-tax money and fund 
each other's buy and sell arrangements. Let's talk loan account quickly um, from a buy and sell perspective. All right, from a firstly. buy and sell perspective, um, basically what happens is the easiest way, especially when you've got a number of partners, is you can't necessarily split up a debit order to different people on one policy. So what generally happens is that the company gets debited the full amount of the policy. Now what has to happen is that based on your percentage holding in the business, you proportionately are paying on somebody else's life. So what effectively has got to happen here is that it has to be allocated according to the loan accounts on a monthly basis. And I have to stress this yeah. because very often people are in a position where they think, oh, I'll leave it until next year when we do our final tax returns, we'll just mm -hmm. allocate the money accordingly and that's fine. All good and well if nobody dies. But if somebody does die and you're in a position where you haven't allocated for one month, you're in a position where estate duty will be charged at 20%, and which is something you might not necessarily have actually calculated into the policy. And 20% of a large value can really start affecting the actual value that's going back to your family. So it's really important. You cannot pay any or part of your own premium at all. And it cannot be seen as if you've done that. And effectively, by owning shares in the business, if say I own 20% share in a business and I'm paying the premium I'm paying 20% of my own premium, which means that there's estate duty implications. Also in terms of loan accounts, what's really important is that when there's a deficit running on a loan account, people need to include that value into their buy and sell agreements as well. Now very often what I see normally happening in the marketplace is that people add it to a key man policy, for example, mm. and that's really the wrong way of doing it because again, you're going to get charged with estate duty. In order to get around the exemption, you need to make sure that that loan account is built into the value. So let's say you owe the company 200,000 Rand. Whatever your value is on your buy and sell agreement, bump that up by 200,000 Rand and effectively it, sets, it basically kills two birds with one stone. Okay, so we're going to include not only the share price, but we're going to have a look at the loan account which was created for a premium funding mm, yes. sort of exercise. Of course, we're going to have to take a little bit of a break now and then we're going to have a look at loan account, but from the opposite direction, a lot of people put that working capital in and demand that they get something back in the event of some type of disaster. We're going to take a sh short commercial break, but when Financially Speaking returns, we'll pick up on our discussion on business assurance and more specifically loan account cover, as well as how to go about disaster-proofing your business.